everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. Welcome back. As the title of the episode says, this is the second half of our employment law conversation with my colleague, Jamie Decovna. Don't worry if you haven't had a chance to listen to the first part yet. We're in a completely different neck of the woods at this point, and you can always check out part one whenever your schedule allows. For now, we're going to pick up right where we left off with Jamie and dig into some of the legal pitfalls associated with being an employer. I have clients who are understandably concerned when a hurricane is approaching or in the immediate aftermath of a storm or some other emergency. And, you know, their security guards, their front desk staff, other employees are not on the premises. What's reasonable to expect when it comes to keeping both the residents and the employees safe during these types of emergencies? And let's get back to our example. Let's assume we don't have a written employment agreement with some of these folks and we don't have an employee handbook because, you, as you well know, many, many of these associations do not have proper employee handbooks. What do we do in that case? Is, is the first thing to like get an employee handbook in place? I think employee handbooks have a lot of value and it's not just because I'm an employment lawyer. I think they have a place because they tell the employee what the expectation is when he or she is hired. For the employer, it sets out what you expect and you can tell your prospective employees or employees once they're hired, these are what I expect from you in terms of our policies and procedures and how we operate and do business. And so it clears up a lot of potential miscommunication and it makes it as clear as possible to them what the expectation is. You know, for example, if you want to take vacation, how do you do that? What's the practice you need to put in place? Sometimes clients say, well, listen, I only have one employee. Does it make sense to have a handbook? Probably not, but you should still have some guidelines in place in terms of vacation, benefits, whatever it is, there may be something that should be written down somewhere so everybody knows and everybody's operating on the same page. But if you have more, and depending on where you are, you know, for example, there are county laws that define employers at a much lower threshold than even federal law. And I know in in Florida, for example, Miami-Dade County considers an employer at only five employees. That captures a lot of employers that otherwise wouldn't be considered an employer under federal law or state law, for example, and they, they have to comply with it. You make a great point because a lot of times people are focused on the federal employment laws, but county ordinances could even require, for instance, I'm thinking jury duty. Even if you had one or two employees and those employees are called to serve on a jury and that goes for weeks, you may have to, you will have to pay that employee for that time served. So it's really important to understand when you have direct employees, what's out there in terms of all the applicable laws and ordinances. And a great way to notify your employees about what those laws are, what you do to comply with them is through a handbook. So they know, and you don't have to really question whether or not they know, because anyone who's looked at a handbook, you usually go to the last page and there's a signed acknowledgement form. And the government agencies love that because they want to know how did you communicate to this individual, what your policy was and how how do you do that? Well, you give them a handbook and you say, well, I gave this to my employee and look, they signed. You can establish that they've at a minimum received a copy and through the wording, it's usually that they agree that they either have read it or will read it. We have to take a little darker turn with the the podcast episode. Now we, we need to talk about breaking up the employer employee relationship. It's gone wrong and the employer wants to say goodbye. So in Florida, Florida is an at-will employment state, which most people know means that you can terminate for any reason, as long as it's not a discriminatory reason. Do you know how many states are like Florida that are at-will employment states? I actually do know the answer. (laughs) So all of them, all of them are at-will. All all 50 states are at-will employment states, meaning you could say goodbye to an employee for no reason at all. 
Okay. And vice versa. They they retain that same right. However, the difference is typically whether or not there's an exception. Some of them have carve outs for public policy. So you can fire them for any reason unless it violates public policy or, you know, an implied contract. You definitely need to make sure that you know based on the state that you're operating in, what is it? So it is at will, but there may be exceptions to the at will provision where either party can leave the relationship at any time for any reason or no reason at all. But is there some other policy in place that says that you can't do that? And if you're in a state that has a a public policy exception, well, guess what? You have to look at that as well. You can't just say, well, the party could end the relationship at any time. You got to look at the exception too. So often when a board tells me that it's time to say goodbye to one of their employees, I get the call and they're asking what they need to do. And my first question is, have there been previous conversations where the employee knows this is coming? And often the answer is, well, no. And so one of my questions is, why are employers so reluctant to communicate their dissatisfaction until they're at their absolute breaking point and ready to say goodbye? Donna, I think that is such a great question. (laughs) Termination is such a critical time in in the relationship because that's when so many things can go awry. But for me, it's really about communication. I mean, we're lawyers. You, You do a podcast. And so we love to communicate. That's what we do. But a lot of people don't really feel comfortable communicating. I think that it's a mistake if you're an employer and you don't communicate because there's so many opportunities to do it, whether it's a performance evaluation, uh, whether it's disciplinary. I mean, they're all they're all different types of communication. And how are you communicating what is expected of an individual if you don't do it until you're ready to end the relationship? I mean, to me, it's a little bit dysfunctional. And so I really think that you need to communicate with them along the way, predominantly because it will benefit the relationship. But if it doesn't, because the person doesn't hear you, even though you've communicated to them numerous times, because we also have clients and we know of associations that are the exact opposite, that they document everything. And it's so good that they do because when I have a client that sends me a whole list of documentation for all the reasons why the relationship didn't work, it always makes it so much easier for me to advise them. And even though the person may not want to hear it, at least they've been told. They know what the problem is. And so they may not want to believe it, but they've been told. But you're not blind inciting anyone. Jamie, what is the best way for boards to engage in progressive discipline? What would that look like? Is it calling the employee into the office, having at least two people from the employer side to, to witness it, drawing up a written document where you've outlined where the poor performance issues are, and then having the employee sign off on that? Or is that overkill? No, progressive discipline is exactly what it sounds like. It escalates. And the progressive discipline is it starts off typically with a verbal warning. You know, hey, I don't like that. You need to do this. This doesn't work for me. This policy is that. You didn't follow it. And usually that's and not always, but usually it's your first time you're going to be uh, made aware that there's a problem is usually a verbal warning. Depending on the severity, it could be a written warning. You're also looking at severity of the situation. The way it generally works is is that it goes from the least severe infraction, most severe infraction. Usually most severe infraction is termination automatic. Typically, you're talking about an escalation. So you, you usually go from verbal warning all the way through termination, including written warnings. And where you fall somewhere in the middle is really depending on what's going on. So if you have an employee that's always coming into work late, the first time the person comes into work late, you probably are going to say to them, hey, listen, you, you got to be here at nine o'clock. 10 o'clock doesn't work for me. I otherwise have to cover your shift if you come an hour late. So it's usually a verbal warning. Well, the person comes in maybe a month later and is late again. This time doesn't let anybody know. No call, no show. Shows up at 1030 and says, well, I was running late. I had who knows what was going on. I got a flat tire. Usually at that point, most employers will give a written warning. If it continues to happen, you will get multiple written warnings and eventually you will reach what I call it's like the point of no return where you are told if you do it again, 
I'm going to terminate you. And so you are told that this is your last and final warning. And then if you you violate another policy or procedure, then at that point you get terminated. Some of our boards, Jamie, are split on whether or not an employee is doing a good job. I mean, one of my largest boards is 25 members. But what happens if some of the board members want to engage in progressive discipline with with the employee and the others don't. And then they come to you and the employee is terminated and the employee is claiming wrongful termination. And the response is, well, we engaged in progressive discipline, but it was really not engaged in on a consensus basis. It was a few members of the board that perceived that this employee's uh, performance was so poor that he or she needed to be written up. Does that impact the, or, or I should say, undermine the association's stance with regard to that termination? Yes. And the reason why I say yes is because you make the job of an attorney so much harder if they ever have to defend your decisions. If some people are split, it's so much better to be unified. And I understand that that's not always possible. But a lot of times, the people who are recommending the discipline, the people who are recommending the termination, it's usually not coming out of nowhere. It's not out of left field. Usually they know what's going on with the employee and that's why they're making the recommendation. And so if a person is making the recommendation on the board that somebody be terminated and other board members may not agree with it, well, they need to find out why they're making that recommendation. And it should be unanimous. I mean, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable voting, okay, fine, don't vote on it. Maybe you abstain from it. But these decisions should be made in unison because if not, it really undermines the whole process because now you give the employee an opportunity to align with board members who maybe were more sympathetic to their cause. All you're doing is a disservice to the association, the employer, because not only is the association having to defend itself and the decision that got made, but also the infighting of what's going on, because now they've aligned with the individual and not the employer, which doesn't help the association at all. No, the infighting can get really ugly. Sometimes an option is given for the employee to resign rather than to be terminated. And I think a lot of times that offer is made in order to save face. Maybe it's a more dignified departure. But what are the advantages and disadvantages to both the employer and the employee if that path is chosen? You know, before we get there, because I do want to talk about that, you know, whether termination or resignation, because there is a difference sometimes. And sometimes there's a difference without a distinction. It, it just depends. But the one thing I wanted to talk about, the favored employee, the person who's been there for 10 years, sometimes 20 years, and owners fall in love. And these employees are almost untouchable. I was just going to use that word, the untouchable employee. I have been involved in situations and I've seen situations where you have beloved employees, but they are are viewed one way by the owners and viewed an entirely different way by board members who deal with them day in and day out. And one of the things that I have noticed and what I, I think really has to be the stance is if a board makes a decision to let an employee go, regardless of whether you agree with it or not, sometimes you have to live with the past decision that got made. It is never a good situation to be in to allow employees to dictate whether or not they stay or go. It really should be the employer that makes those decisions, not the employees. And when the employees feel that they have more power than the employer, it really changes how you're able to operate and how you're able to function because you have employees that come and go and do what they want. They violate policies all the time. And sometimes they do it to the owner's benefit. And so they're completely okay with it, but they don't understand it creates a lot of friction and primarily among other staff members. And so a lot of employees who follow all the rules, they feel, well, why should I follow the rules if so-and-so does it? And then if so-and-so just, you know, kicks and screams, no one's going to fire him or her. And so maybe I should act like that. I have never seen a set of documents, Jamie, that said the decision to hire or fire rested with the members. The decision to hire or fire rests with the board. But to your point, which is 
it's so true is that in some communities, an employee has managed to achieve a level of protection with a certain segment of the of the resident population. In a few of my communities, I've actually seen recall petitions uh, underway because they didn't like that the board was letting go of a particular employee. Can the board share with the residents all the reasons that went into it? I think not. Uh, That would not be my recommendation to say, hey, you know, we're firing Stan because he did this wrong and he did this wrong. These are privileged communications between the employer employee. So a lot of times the board can't even defend their decision because they can't open up all the reasons that they've ultimately decided to let this employee go. You're right. And and I wouldn't recommend it either. I mean, I view it as confidential and I think it's something that shouldn't be discussed. I think that there is a way to craft statements to the communities as best as you can in a difficult situation to basically tell the owners, we're volunteers, we're trying and to do our best. And every decision we make isn't going to be the most popular decision but understand we have fiduciary obligations to do what is best for the community. And sometimes that's making difficult decisions. And so I think how you craft it, it may not necessarily resolve resentment among owners who who really like an employee, but at least it puts it out there. Hey, listen, this was a decision that we made. It's unfortunate what happened. We're not at liberty to discuss it. We're not going to discuss it, but to suffice it to say we have reasons for why we made this decision and it really is for the betterment of the community. Now I do want to answer because I, I didn't, I don't want you to think I'm not going to answer your question <laughs> about whether or not we resign or termination. So sometimes, and, and I really feel that it's for the benefit of the employee, you offer them the opportunity to resign. Legally, if you are going to fire an employee and you say to them, I'm going to give you the option, resign or termination. It's to your benefit to take resignation, not because you're going to have a problem getting unemployment, because unemployment views it the same as termination. It's a constructive termination. You're really not being given an option at all. But for purposes of finding a new job, Mm -hmm. for purposes of optics, you and a lot of times with higher level employees, you'll see this where they will be given the option to resign. And so the board can say, so-and-so has resigned. They've made the decision to move on. We're not at liberty to discuss it further, but we're looking for, you know, if it's general manager, for example, we're looking for a new general manager and we'll do our best to find that individual. The general manager can then go out and look for another job. And if prospective employer says, well, why did you leave this community? They can say, I left on my, you know, on my sure. own accord. I, I, I made the decision to resign and for whatever reason, but both sides can say that it was an employee's decision. Now, if that same general manager wants to go file for unemployment, he can do that. That leads me to my next question. Well, let's say you've had an employee that's really done you wrong, stolen some property, harassed people. Should a board ever consider fighting unemployment and an unemployment claim? I feel it's one of the things that people don't really think that much about because they have strong feelings about why the person left. Um, A lot of times there's a problem when they fight. Sometimes employees just want their unemployment and they're not going to stay on it forever. And I wouldn't say that that's always the case because there's certainly people who abuse the system who will stay on unemployment until they're kicked off of unemployment. But a lot of them are really looking for other jobs. And when you fight them, and especially if you're wrong, and you fight them without a good reason for, for why you're fighting them, you could lose. And not only could you lose, it could have other consequences. I once had a client that fought unemployment and rightfully so, but the hearing went totally sideways and they weren't represented by me at the time I came in, you know, on, I guess, fortunately at, at act two, but the lawyer at the time said, listen, you, you, you don't need a lawyer to go with you and, and handle it. And, and the hearing became a, a lot more about not the reason why she left, but about what she believed the reasons for, for why she was let go. And, and she felt that it was discrimination. So it became this whole hearing about discrimination. And really, in my mind, what it should have just been about was benefits. But it had this really unfortunate transcript 
that sort of took on a life of its own. So you really need to think about it. I mean, do you have a good reason to fight it? If you don't have a good reason to fight it, maybe you shouldn't. If you do have a good reason and the person really isn't entitled, entitled to unemployment, I had one, one association client, the um, individual resigned. The client loved this person, didn't want them to leave. In fact, said, what can we do to make you stay? And the person said, no, I don't want to stay. I don't even remember what he ended up going to do. But then he filed for unemployment. And the client said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute here. Not only did we not let you go, you left on your own accord. Not only did you leave on your own accord, we begged you to stay. <laughs> and you said no. So why should you get unemployment? In any event, it, it went up you know, through stuff. I think maybe one or two levels of appeal and ultimately sided with the association. And, you know, I don't think it was a situation where they really wanted to, but they, they really felt that it it set bad precedent. You know, people can't leave here for a different opportunity and then turn around and ask for unemployment that we're then responsible for paying. And that's a unique situation. I haven't heard that one before, but I guess the, I guess the, the 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 parting advice is don't don't fight it to be vengeful. But if there's a legitimate reason not to agree to the unemployment claim, because look, you pay employers pay for this, and and right. presumably rates can go up for your right. unemployment claims. I get this question a lot, Jamie. Is it safe for an employer to terminate someone when they are out on some sort of leave? whether that's a parental leave or sick leave, let's say the person was doing a terrible job before they went out on leave, or while they're gone, the employer realizes we really don't need this position anymore. Is it safe to do that at that point? I would definitely need more information. So for example, you can terminate people who happen to be on leave You can't terminate them, for example, let's say the person, because normally where I see it, I'm sure you do too, is with uh, workers' comp. So the individual got injured on the job. He or she hasn't been back to work. They're getting treatment. There's probably bad communication with the insurance agent trying to figure out whether or not the claim is still being adjusted, et cetera. And the client then comes to you and says, we we need to hire somebody. We, why can't we fire this person? I'm a little more concerned in a situation like that versus we're getting rid of all of our employees. This person happens to be on workers' comp, but we are outsourcing all of that work. If you outsource all of that work, it really has nothing to do with the individual. There's other other people who are also terminated along with this individual. I'm less concerned about a situation like that, but If it feels like it may be a problem to you, trust your gut, ask somebody. You may be right and it may not be a problem, but if you trust your gut and you think it's a problem, you may hear that validation when, you know, a client, for example, calls you or, you know, calls me and I say, well, you know, I don't know that I would do that. Let's talk about it. And in a situation where it's a bad employee, you know, what have you done to document it prior to the person going out on leave? And one of the things that just grates on me is where they say, I probably should have terminated this person a long time ago. Before they went on leave. (laughs) Yes. And, and I always ask, why didn't you? Well, that gets back to, yeah, that gets back to our prior conversation about, you know, varying degrees of communication skills. But I will say this for our podcast listeners, Jamie's answer does not constitute specific legal advice to you, nor does anything we're talking about today. This is to open up the conversation. Please speak to your own association attorney, specifically one who has expertise in in employment law. I love the disclaimer. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so let's let's talk briefly because we're not. This is not a primer on how to to sue your employer, but just briefly, if an employee feels that he or she has been t- terminated wrongfully, what are just the laws that they would be looking to to, to potentially file a claim under? So it depends um, the circumstances under which the person's leaving. It depends on how many other employees are are there in an organization. So, for example, if you have two employees and the person says, I believe that I was terminated because I'm a woman or I was harassed. I mean, if the law doesn't consider you're an, an employer, an employer under the law, there may not be anything that you can do. But if there 
is, you know, uh, I should say a law that applies and an individual feels that they've been you know, treated unfairly. It depends why. And so I think that you have to look at a situation and typically I'm representing the employer. And so if I have a client that gets a complaint, for example, an employee says before he or she is terminated, or even when he or she's being terminated, Hey, by the way, I never told you this before, but my boss harassed me. My antenna immediately goes up and and I tell the client, you need to investigate this. And a lot of times clients are dismissive of it, but my I live in a world where I litigate these issues all the time and I feel like you can't afford to be dismissive of it. And, you know, for employees out there, because every now and again, I will represent an employee, but in a situation where I'm representing an employee, what's happened to you? What have you done to document it? What have you said? Why do you feel that you've been treated wrongfully? Sometimes people just think, well, it's unfair. You know, I was employed for nine years and then they fired me. Okay, well, um, is there any other reason why you feel the termination is unfair? Well, no, no, just I did a good job. And, and they said I didn't. And, and so I don't think. Well, there's not tenure in, in most. In academia, there's tenure. But in many other industries, there's not. You're, you're exactly right. But when somebody says, you know, for example, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pregnant and I told my supervisor that I needed leave. And assuming the association is large enough and they have 50 employees and the supervisor says, I don't know how, what I'm going to do if you go on leave. I don't know that, that you should go on leave or now I have to replace you temporarily because you had to go and get pregnant. I mean, you know, and as crazy as it sounds, there are things like that that happen in the world where people discriminate in violation of the law, people harass in violation of the law. Sometimes it's because you hire bad managers that aren't trained in the law or maybe they are trained in the law and they just don't care And a lot of employees don't always know their rights. So sometimes they don't even know until they go and talk to somebody that they've been treated wrongfully. But I think, especially when you're talking about an association, you're talking about an employer that has an obligation to comply with the law. If they hear something that maybe doesn't sound right, they should absolutely look into it. Even if they ultimately come to the same conclusion that, hey, there's no problem here. At a minimum, they can say, well, hey, we investigated the situation. Don't don't just shove it under the rug. 100%. Look into it and document what you've done. Because at the end of the day, if the employee does then file a lawsuit um, or claim with the EEOC, for example, or the Florida Commission on Human Relations or any state entity, if you're outside the state of Florida, what have you done to document it? We don't always have the benefit of hindsight. But I can tell you, you know, and you know, it's like we have the benefit of experience. We've done this for a long time and we can tell you and share with you our experiences so you don't make those mistakes that we've had other clients make. So what should you be doing? You should be documenting. You should be investigating. You should be talking to various witnesses, people who you've been told have information, people who may not have information, but also report to the same supervisor. What are their experiences? I've had clients that sometimes don't know who they've hired. And I had a situation once where a manager had harassed a lot of the female employees. And at the time they went to terminate one of the female employees, she said, well, if this is coming from him, he, you know, it's retaliatory. Yes, he's done these things. They ultimately ended up in a situation where they were going to renew his contract and were going to fire this this woman. And, you know, I don't even know what made them, but thankfully somebody somewhere told them they needed to talk to a lawyer. And so they brought me in. During my investigation, there were multiple women I spoke with who all said the same thing, that this guy was bad and did very bad things and said things that he should not be saying. And the board was shocked because nobody knew him in that way. And I said, listen, here's the thing. I, I, I understand that you may be scratching your head and have a hard time reconciling this. But if you hear it from multiple people, and I'm not saying that it, you know, they couldn't have orchestrated it, but in this particular situation, one of the women I called didn't even work there anymore. And I called her on the lark. Thankfully, she spoke to me, 
you know, I think she was out shopping at the time. And I asked her, I said, well, what do you know about this guy? And immediately her demeanor changed. And she told me you know, one of the reasons why I left was because of him. And, and I said, you may not believe any of these other women, but why wouldn't you believe her? She left here because of him. You didn't fire her. She has no reason to lie. She didn't even know I was going to call her. You know, she's out having, having a nice day shopping. And so sometimes it's eye opening. But the point is, you wouldn't have known that unless you asked. You wouldn't have known unless you thought enough to have an investigation. And then once they had that information, they then made a different decision than they otherwise were going to make had they not had the benefit of the additional information. It's a really good point. Listen, there's a duty to investigate in, in an, any number of circumstances in, in associations. You get a noise complaint. You know, do you do you do you just ignore it or do you go to the units around that unit and say, hey, are you hearing the same thing? Are you you know what's going on here? So it's a really good point. And it's a nice segue into the next section I wanted to talk to you about, which is workplace safety, Jamie. So the Occupational and Safety Health Administration, or OSHA, is where at least I typically look for guidelines on workplace safety. What does the average board of directors need to know about in terms of creating a safe work environment for its employees? OSHA, if you employ somebody, it applies to you. Again, you know, looking at interstate commerce, again, it's expansive rather than restrictive. Even just one employee? I, I, I'd say yes. Right. <laughs> and the reason why I say yes is because if you're a person who employs an individual that affects interstate commerce... Chances are pretty good. Yes. I mean, so OSHA doesn't apply. You know, there are some exceptions to when OSHA would apply, but I'd say for the most part, it would apply. And I also think sometimes even if it doesn't apply, they're probably pretty good practices. OSHA has minimum safety requirements that it imparts on employers and also, you know, guidelines to make sure that people are treated just like human beings. I mean, so some of the things that seem silly, but it actually even dictates the number of bathrooms based on the number of employees that you have to have available. But it's also a lot more expansive, you know, so it's, it's you know, requiring that you provide training to individuals so they know how to use safety equipment. It's purchasing safety equipment if people are using things and you'd be surprised how expansive it can be. So it's anybody who's working with tools, you know, it could be even housekeeping staff that are working with toxic chemicals. Or just or just emptying those trash receptacles. So in one of my high rises, Jamie, it, the, the issue was how you got the bins that came down and then moved those bins over to where the trash collection area was. So to your point, it it can be incredibly expansive depending on what's going on. And recently with the COVID crisis in some of our high rises, I know we want to talk about that is we had employees who were being asked to go to households that were quarantining in terms of removing their trash delivering their mail and and even in some cases walking their dogs because we didn't want those people leaving their units to traverse through the common areas to get in the elevators when they had an active COVID infection. I think OSHA was probably turned on its head during the pan, you know, pandemic, the pause, whatever you want to call it, you know, with COVID for sure, because it had obligations to maintain a safe work environment. And what does that look like? And so OSHA was, you know, along with the CDC, was one of, you know, the first government agencies to come out and say, listen, here's kind of what we expect for you to maintain a safe work environment. This is obviously pre-vaccine, but, you know, all the things that you see, like social distancing, frequent hand washing, all of those safety precautions that, that you want to see to protect people, they're the government agency that was mandating it. And then also responsible for making sure that you comply because OSHA, like a lot of other laws, have what we call whistleblower retaliation component. So you can't afford not to comply because if you have an employee that says, hey, wait a minute, you didn't provide proper safety harnesses, you didn't provide training, you didn't provide a safe work environment, and here's why. They can go and file an OSHA claim against you for having an unsafe workplace. And then if you do anything to this individual, because for example, you find them to be a nuisance and you don't want to listen to what they have to say and you terminate them, they can then turn around and bring a claim as a whistleblower. To me, it really makes just good business sense 
to comply on the front end and do the things that you know you should be doing, you know, to make sure that employees are safe and that they have the ad- adequate protections that they need to make sure that they can do their job in a safe way that doesn't put them in in jeopardy. And they oversee this if an employee actually dies on the job, which can happen. For our associations, Jamie, that employ employees directly, what kind of signage requirements do they need to know about? Workplace signage requirements. Yes. So the nice thing is OSHA makes it really simple for you. There's an OSHA signage that you have to put up in the workspace. So you just need the OSHA poster. So you get the OSHA poster and you can put it in a break room. There, there are a lot of different laws that require signage. So you just go to their website and you can get the poster? Correct. You can just go and get the poster, you put it up. Most most employers do comply, but if they are non-compliant, why not do it tomorrow? Make sure you comply get it right. before you have a problem. You, you touched on sexual harassment just a few minutes ago, and I just wanted to circle back to that. So sexual harassment can take a number of different forms, okay? It could be an employee being harassed by other employees, could be an employee being harassed by a member of the board or by a resident. It could be the employee who was harassing any of the foregoing people. So what should a basic sexual harassment policy look like? Should associations be doing, you know, they can go online, they can get tutorials. And do you recommend that kind of training? Well, I think training is really imperative if you have a larger staff and you have management. I I really feel like you can't afford not to do training on it. It's so simple. And I think it's really an obligation on the part of the employer to make sure that at a minimum, their management is trained and understands what they need to do or what they shouldn't do in order to make sure they comply with the law. A good policy really is something that defines what it is. It tells you what happens to you if if there is a violation of this particular policy. Some of them have examples of what harassment may look like, and then explains reporting requirements. And then usually at the end, what you see is something about the process. We investigate, we let you know, we maintain confidentiality. And then importantly, that there's no retaliation if you report in good faith or you're asked to participate in an investigation regarding it. In some of my communities, Jamie, we are having some issues because we've got a melting pot. We've got uh, people from different cultures. We've got very wide age ranges. We've got millennials working with people in their 80s and 90s who may not, you know, look in their day and age, calling somebody sweetie was really not a big deal. And so we've got a lot of, you know, different sensibilities now in some of these communities. So I think, again, perhaps some training, you know, just shining a little bit of a light on it, but but also it's a really sensitive topic and I think it needs to be handled sensitively. Absolutely. To your point, I mean, what may offend one person doesn't necessarily offend somebody else. I mean, someone may say you calling me sweetheart or honey isn't offensive, but there are plenty of people who will look at you sideways if you call them that and will say, you know, my name is Jamie. Don't call me sweetie. Don't call me honey. I'm not in any way, shape or form, you're sweetie (laughs) or honey. I don't want to be called that. So please don't. I mean, listen, I think the theme here is communication because there's also a responsibility. I mean, and a lot of these policies will tell you as an employee, if somebody says that to you, sometimes it's easy enough to say to somebody, please don't call me that. Please just call me by my name. It makes me uncomfortable when you say that. Sometimes, not always. And then no and then no reason to escalate at that point. But sometimes these things do do escalate because of that lack of communication. But again, for you and I, this is kind of what we do for a living. So it so it's easy, you know, it's easier for us perhaps to, to take that route than it is for yeah, other people. I agree. Well, you mentioned how dependent some of this is in terms of the current administration. You, at the outset, you mentioned that. And, and I have to, to bring up President Biden's new vaccine mandate. Um, it does, it's not going to apply to most associations, but it will apply to large management companies. Does an association need to concern itself with a vaccine mandate? And if the association has direct employees and wants to require all of them to be vaccinated, is that okay? Obviously, this is this is the hot button topic of the day, <laughs> mandatory vaccination. So I will say this first, it does matter where you're located, because we all know EEOC has come out and said 
you can mandate vaccinations as long as you provide exceptions for uh, religious accommodations or potential uh, reasons to accommodate based on a person's medical history or current medical status, potential disability, et cetera. Where you are matters in terms of whether or not you have to comply. And funny enough, even though the law and it looks like it keeps inching closer and closer, you know, to becoming, you know, something that is a reality is how it's going to be impacted by state laws, potentially city laws, et cetera. But I have seen even smaller employers that on their own, so even though they're they're not covered by that mandate, they themselves have decided as an organization, and certainly I'm sure you know, with associations, homeowners, and especially in condos where you're just in a building, a lot of them are moving toward mandatory vaccination. And they are taking the position that you need to be vaccinated if you want to work here, just like any other policy, you need to comply with it. And if you don't want to comply with it, then you don't have to work here. The law is going to evolve a lot. It is not a very well established body of law. The closest thing, which I think is a little different, but the closest thing we have to it is the flu vaccine. So we've seen how that plays out in courts. We've had some courts that have actually looked into this particular issue and have said vaccine mandates are okay, which is aligning with what the EEOC says. But there are some states that have come out and said, listen, it's all fine and well. The EEOC can say what it wants, but you can't mandate that. You know, I've seen some interesting opinions that have come out because they're government employees and it's viewed a little differently than a private employer. But certainly, I mean, you turn on the news today and that's all you hear about these big companies companies that have taken a position and said, we're going to mandate it. I think for a lot of businesses, though, they're still somewhere in the middle and trying to figure out where they want to go, concerned about going to mandate because they're afraid they're not going to be able to staff appropriately. And then that combined with maybe they still want to give people an opportunity you know, to have a choice in whether or not they get vaccinated. I I think over time, you're, you're going to see this evolve a lot. You know, before the pandemic started, I remember it was a year before this had to, maybe two, had to be in 2018. I remember going to the hospital for a routine test. At that time, there were there were healthcare workers, nurses, and, and people with staffers wearing masks. And I said, "What? why are some of your staffers wearing masks and some not? And the answer I got is because the ones who are wearing the mask did not get the flu vaccine. And that was well before the COVID pandemic. And so I wonder if that also won't be a possibility for some employers, not not a full vaccine mandate, because again, as you said, there are exceptions for religious and, and, and health reasons. But, you know, that still sticks with me now because that was happening two years before the, the pandemic in the particular hospital that I visited. No, absolutely. Well, you know, and before we even had the vaccine, one of the questions that kept popping up is, can I mandate a, a, a mask? I mean, so that was coming up and it was, you know, really still pulling on that same analysis of do you need to provide an, a reasonable accommodation to an employee that can't wear a mask, either for religious or for medical reasons? And so what does that look like? You know, I think it'll be interesting, just as my own personal observation on on, on the subject is, it, I think it is very interesting in that you're essentially pitting one set of employees versus another, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. You know, why do the unvaccinated have any greater rights than the vaccinated? And incidentally, vice versa. And, you know, I, I think probably it's it's more a reflection of our larger society today that there's a lot of discord, unfortunately. But, you know, when it comes to making that analysis, and especially in a situation where it's a pandemic and people are are dying on account of it in terms of having to provide a reasonable accommodation, it's not always possible, you know, given what a person does. I mean, I've had clients that say, well, listen, this person works at the front desk. All they do is interface with people all day long. The owners are insisting that everybody be vaccinated. And so one of the things that I have found very interesting, especially in association land, sometimes management has more trepidation about whether or not they're going to mandate vaccination and whether or not they do it is really being largely driven by the members. The members are insisting on it. The board members are insisting on it. And, you know, when they work for the board, 
it's got to listen to the board if that's what the board wants. I mean, if, you know, it's ultimately challenged in court and a judge says otherwise, I guess you comply. You know, every organization has to figure out what makes sense for them. But the problem that, that we're all seeing is the unprecedented labor shortage that everyone is experiencing. You see it when you go to your favorite restaurant. You see it. I was just in New York City, went back to some some tried and true restaurants. And it, in a few of them, I should say many of them, it was different. You could tell it was a whole new staff. Um, you see it when you're going into your shops. You're seeing it when you're ordering something. And what used to take days is taking weeks and or in some places, even months. So, you know, if an association doesn't want to go with a management company and they want to go with direct employees. And I, I'm assuming based on how long you've been doing this, Jamie, do you have any tips on where they can find employees, particularly if they're looking for, let's say, hey, we only want vaccinated employees, so they need to do the employee search. Do you have any tips with a you know, staffing company, recruiter? There are definitely search engines that this is, you know, what they specialize in. I would say search engines, but companies that that's exactly, you know, indeed monster, whatever the one is, the company de jour that, that today is where people are looking for to go and get jobs. Fascinating. I don't know. And again, it's my own observation. It's where have all these people gone? <laughs> don't, that's that's where what they, I want to know. <laughs> where do they all go? It's like people just leave planet Earth. And we, and, you know, I don't know if it's just, you know, a lot of these workers that are in frontline jobs or people that are low paid that are just refusing to go back. And if employers feel that there is a labor shortage, and I've even had clients, and I'm sure you have too, that have gone back and they've looked at their pay scale recently. And I've had a lot of clients that have adjusted their pay scale just to bring in applicants because some of them weren't even getting anyone to apply for the jobs <laughs> because people didn't want to come and work for, you know, $12 an hour. They they want more. And so there are definitely online recruiters who specialize depending on you know, what the position is that you're trying to fill, you know, also depending on your community. I mean, I know, and you know, it's like, we have some clients that use really high end search companies that get paid a lot of money to find you the right individual. So I I think you have to figure out what works for you. And and also, um, you know, bear in mind that there are costs involved. There's also a time cost, you know, because you've got to weed through and hopefully find people. And if you're not finding people, I think you have to take a step back and, and, and say, why aren't we attracting the talent? Because I don't think people have literally left the planet Earth. I I think that you as an employer have an obligation to attract the talent you want. And so if you want that, because we certainly have, I mean, how many clients do you know, Donna, that have 20-year employees, 30-year employees, people who retire after having worked in a building. So they, they get to know these owners and they really have good relationships with them. And I think that that's a positive, you know, not and it's not always money. about money. Often, right. often it's about the, the culture and it's about the right. environment and it's about being appreciated. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And that's why I say, sometimes you got to take a step back and say, you know, are we creating the culture that we want to attract the kind of people we want? And if the answer is yes, you probably won't have a hard time hiring people, but if the answer is no, then why is it now? I mean, do you have people who are part of your team? You know, we all hear that, you know, that phrase toxic workplace. Is there somebody creating that toxicity in the workplace? And if they do, maybe they're the problem. Maybe you need to remove them, that individual, or maybe you need to change that policy, or maybe you need to change your pay scale and attract the the talent that you want so you can hopefully retain the people who are good. Sometimes the toxic person is a resident. And that gets, that's yeah. now that gets back to my job. That <laughs> That's a lot more. Yes, we'll talk, yes. We will talk about that in a future episode. One final thought. What's the biggest employment mistake you think community associations make? I love this question. Not calling us. <laughs> Making, <laughs> and it, it sounds so cliche, but how many times have you had a client who did what they thought was the right thing to do? And they've acted accordingly. And then everything goes wrong on account of that one decision that got made. And then they call you. They're already knee deep in this mess. It's so much easier for us to help you, to guide you through a particular issue, to be proactive instead of being reactive. I am 
more often than not reactive. And I'm sure you are as well. It's like the situation has already occurred and then they come to you like, Hey, I have a problem. The best thing people can do is to come to us when they think there may be a problem. So I think the biggest mistake is coming to us after the fact, after they made a situation worse (laughs) because they didn't come to us before it got really bad. And so I think that, you know, sometimes with certain boards, they have to have a little bit more awareness about what's going on. And and folks, that initial call could have been a 30 to 45 minute call just to get you on the right path. If you wait till after the fact, you might be in litigation. At that point, we're talking dozens, if not hundreds of hours of legal time to get you out of that. Yeah, it's an ounce of prevention, right? It's like we're an apple a day, keep the doctor away. It's the same thing with less lawyers. I mean, you know, sometimes we only need like 20 minutes we can help guide you. And that's 20 minutes of our time that's well spent for you, that puts you on the right path. So hopefully you avoid having to use us when it is litigation. Hopefully it never even gets to that point and you can save some dollars. Jamie, I can't thank you enough for being on the show today. You've given our listeners some, some great advice and great tips. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Leave a review so more people can take it to the board and visit takeittotheboard.com for more information.